So again, thank you for uh, coming to our VCAP webinar series. Today we're going to be covering troubleshooting virtual machine disk performance problems. As we mentioned yesterday, there's four big resource objects that you deal with when you're working with VMware, CPU, memory, disk, and network. So today we're going to be focusing on disk. And uh, my name is Sean MacArthur, and along with me today is David Sellens. Uh, these are some of our certifications. Uh, David's been working with VMware since the 2.5 days, and I got in right at the latter end of 2.5 into the 3.0 days. Uh, we've both been VMware trainers for a long time, and we have several other certifications in Microsoft and other things like that. Dave is a, sort of a SQL specialist, and I specialize more in Exchange, so together we can do some damage. Um, we, we do, I do personally a lot more consulting nowadays than I do training, and I've done things like performance analysis for companies like Bridgewater Hedge Funds. I implemented a product called uh, VFoglight for them, uh, which used to be owned by Quest, and now ultimately it's owned by Dell. Uh, we've done a lot of DR implementations for companies, so uh, things like SRM uh, for their virtual machines, protecting them, products like Zerto. Uh, replication with things like uh, EMC, NetApps, 3PAR, all kinds of different stuff, backups, physicals, pretty pretty interesting stuff with that when you look at DR. And we've just done tons of Active Directory and Exchange migrations. We've done over 50 uh, exchange migrations for various size companies, all the way from 30 people to 30,000 plus. So. Uh, lots of experience with these things. We try and bring that into our, our training. So not going to make this a real salesy presentation. We want this to be more of a technical presentation, so we don't want to bore you with all the other sales junk. We'll get that later. So when we look at disk performance, this is one of the things that we see, which is one of the most common causes of performance issues. Uh, lots of things that it could be. Maybe your disks are too slow. Maybe your throughput to your disks are too slow. One of the things Dave and I were talking about yesterday after our presentation was with normal disks, you know, let's just say SATA disks on a small SAN, you're probably not going to saturate your one gig links going to those small SATA disks. But when you're running SSDs on a backend array, you now could very likely saturate your one gig links. In our environment, we're running 10 gigabit links, and Dave was mentioning yesterday that we normally, on a regular basis, go above 2 gigabits per second. So if we were, if we were running 1 gig E, we would saturate, I mean, we'd be over that all the time. So, you know, it depends on the speed of your storage, the amount of users that you have, and a lot of things like that. Depending on what you're checking, uh, a lot of different tools you can use, and we're going to get into some of these today pretty heavy. Uh, ESX Top which we looked at yesterday. It's a command line tool. It's uh, from Linux, the top command. They've just ported it to work with VMware called ESX top. If you ever deal with VMware from a technical support standpoint, this is what they're using. And it, it's really an awesome tool, very powerful, um, but it's not something you're going to master in two minutes. It's, it's, uh, it's going to take some work, lots of counters to look at. VSCSI stats, since we're talking about disks, is another tool. Now, for Windows guys like me, ESX Top is great, but why do something on command line when you got to get a GUI tool? So they have a visual ESX Top you can use. And we'll let Dave show you what that looks like. Um, I always believe in starting out easy, so we look at all the GUI tools available to us, like vCenter Performance, which is the graphical performance monitors available through ESX or vCenter. Um, operations Manager, which is now vRealize Operations, uh, gives you real-time statistics, but it also gives you predictive statistics for things that could happen. Like if you're running out of hard drive space, it'll tell you based upon your current usage, you're going to run out of hard drive space in 30 days. Um, other real basic things like Windows, Task Manager, Perfmon within Windows, uh, different counters depending on what you're looking for. And there's some other tools that we're going to use and show in class. 
Jet stress is a tool that uh, Microsoft has you can use to put on uh, exchange servers to stress the disks prior to putting them into production and see how they perform. So a neat little tool. Iometer is a freely available tool that you can use to stress disks and network, and we're actually going to show a demo of that. And as I mentioned, performance monitor. When you look at the storage architecture here, there's really a lot of things we have to look at. We have the physical architecture on the bottom with our CPUs, memory, disk, and NICs. And to get to our disk, we're going to be connected to a controller, an HVA. Now, the, the disk could be local in your ESX host. The, the problem with local disks and VMware is then we can't do things like vMotion or um, DRS. So we want to put our disks on some sort of centralized storage, which means we're, we're going to have a fiber channel. HPA going with one, two, four, eight, 16 gig fiber channel back to that. And then we're going to have some uh, fiber channel switches in the middle there. And then we'll have a bunch of our spinning disks or SSD in there. We have iSCSI, which is now going through either a dedicated iSCSI HPA or the physical NICs within that server. Um, and then through our TCP IP network. So we have that option available to us. And then we have NFS, which is going through NICs as well. Um, but it operates a little bit differently than what the iSCSI and the fiber channel do where we're creating LUNs. Now, there's a separation between this hardware on the bottom. And I like to draw a little line right here. Where on the bottom is my physical hardware, everything above that is software. So the VM kernel, which is represented by that orangish yellow box there, is the software that powers VMware. That's the, the heart of VMware, the kernel. And the VM kernel is responsible for taking a virtual machine when the virtual machine wants to access a physical resource like a CPU. The VM goes to the VM kernel and says, hey, I need to use a CPU. The VM kernel then goes through its scheduler and schedules that guest CPU to use the physical CPU on the actual server. So the VM kernel is responsible for all of that. It also works with the memory and putting virtual memory to physical memory or to swap if we don't have enough. Uh, it also then can map NICs and also down to our SCSI controllers and access to the disks. So lots of things when we're building VMs, when we look at disks, there's several different ways we can build the VMs, whether it's using a VMDK on some sort of shared disk architecture, using a in-guest iSCSI initiator, which is getting to be fairly common nowadays, especially if you have NetApp storage. Now you're taking a Microsoft iSCSI initiator inside the VM, connecting directly through your NICs out to your NetApp. So those are some of the storage architecture. Dave, would you like to add anything on this slide right here that where I pretty much covered? I think you're in good shape. Uh... You know, the real real big thing, of course, is is as we're going into SSDs, and we'll we'll get into that as we get, as we go on further through. Okay, great, thanks. Now, Iometer is a great tool for doing a couple of things. Number one, it's a free tool. Go to iometer.org, and you can get access to the tool. But number one, like it says on the slide, it's a workload generator. So we can go out and take our VM that's not doing nothing throw iometer on there and generate a workload, which is great. So we can stress the VM. But then using that same tool, we can go out and measure the stress that we put on that VM. So that's pretty neat. And we're going to use that today. So we can emulate both disk and network IO load for any program. So we can see, you know, I know that this SQL program is going to generate 20,000 IOPS. Is my SAN going to handle it? Let's create a VM and let's throw iometer on it and see if it'll handle 20,000 IOPS. And let's look at the path and look, let's stress this guy out and see what it'll do. So we can look at the performance of the disk, of the network controllers, bandwidth, latency. You know, we're talking about buses here, which is going to be some interesting things there. The, th the network throughput to the drives, if we're talking, you know, going across fiber channel or NFS or iSCSI. The bus performance the hard drive performance, network performance, all kinds of stuff. So it uh, made up of two programs, Iometer, which is the controlling program, and then Dynamo, which actually 
generates the workload, so there is no user interface with that. And here's what iometer looks like here. Um, and you can see over here we're doing some disk stuff, so we're looking at total I.O. per second and megabytes per second and some things like that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because we're going to, Dave's actually going to demo that. Now here is just going into performance. So we've got a nimble array and you can see that down at the bottom. Nimble is what we like to call hybrid storage. It's made up of some SSDs which perform caching and then it's got some SATA drives in there for long-term high capacity storage. Um, and our nimble has 10 giggy controllers on it. It's got two controllers. So if you look over here, uh, the, the the top part of the performance in this particular chart has a graphical interface, and you can see that we're hovered over somewhere, don't really know where, but we've got this little box um, right here. Oops. I'm trying to draw on the screen. Let me get this real quick. We've got this little box right here, and if we hover over something, it's going to tell us at this specific point in time what these different things are that it's measuring. In this particular case, it's looking at the write rate for the nimble SCSI disk, which is zero. Uh, the write rate over here for the other one is 150 kilobytes per second. And when you're watching these, you really need to look at if we're doing kilobytes or kilobits and be able to translate that. And then down at the bottom is where I really like to look here at the numerical numbers in there and, and see what is my current number at the latest, what's been the maximum, what's been the minimum, and what am I kind of averaging for reads and writes in this particular case here. So that's kind of how you'll use the performance. So if I'm having a, a potential performance issue, this is one of the first places I go, gives you real quick, easy, and we're looking at this in real time, as you can tell right up here at the top, disk in real time. Uh, but we can go into chart options here and we can change that. We can actually view that and look at past history. You know, what were we doing last week? What were we doing last month? Uh, you know, we were having a problem back in July. What was what happened back then? And depending on the level of counters that we have set up, we can we can see all that. So what what kind of performance counters are important to us when we're using for disk using that? Well, disk reads and writes per second, which is very simple to understand. How many times are we reading or writing every second? Latency. What latency tells us is I'm trying to write right now. But I, I gotta wait for some sort of reason. So that's your latency. Disk queue length is you have multiple things trying to write to the disk simultaneously, but it's only doing one at a time. So what are the rest of the things doing? They're waiting in a queue. So you know, having a couple things in the queue isn't a big deal. Getting a lot of stuff in the queue can be really bad. Now, VMware's come up with a bunch of different technologies to help eliminate having your queue depth be too big. Things like when you're running LUN-based storage, whether it's iSCSI or Fiber Channel, you could have real problems if you have too many VMs on the same LUN. NFS, you don't really run into that. And with vSphere 6, VMware came up with the concept of what's called vVaults, where storage vendors have almost had to rebuild their storage firmware because each VM will have a separate volume for each disk and then a separate volume for the actual VM and some of the files in it itself. So the cool thing about that is now we don't have to worry about disk queue lengths because everything has its own volume. We've got to create a whole bunch of lungs on the SAN, but that's all auto done through VMware. And now we can control backup and replication on a per LUN basis. So maybe I want my exchange server to take LUN number three of that VM and replicate it every one hour, but LUN number four can be replicated every six hours. So you got some really cool things you can do with VMOs. IOPS is just your IO per second, which is how much can this disk or this array of disks handle for IO per second. So obviously 15,000 RPM disks will do more than 10, and 10 will do more than 72, and SSDs will do more than any of those. And as we're seeing SSDs mature, we used to have small SSDs, which were really quick. Now we're starting to see capacity being added to those SSDs. And I think Dave and I were talking about, we saw a 15 terabyte SSD that's either 
getting ready to be in production or it's already in production. So now we're seeing capacity of SSDs go up along with the speed. So we're starting to see disk change. And there will be a time in the near future when none of us will have spinning disks anymore. Our entire arrays will be all SSDs as soon as price and capacity kind of meet a level that makes sense. So we're going to see a big change there. Within the monitor, we'll look at disk, data store, and the virtual disks. And Dave's going to demonstrate here with real-time statistics might have different counters than going back and grabbing statistics from a month ago. When you configure your vCenter logging, we control the logging level. And what's interesting is I'll, I'll go into customers and they'll say, my disk is showing this right now. I had a problem two weeks ago. Let's go look at that. We go two weeks ago and they go, well, how come I have 20 counters right in real time, but I only got two counters when we go back and look a week or a month ago? Well, the problem is they have vCenter set to the default logging level, which is level one. So it's not saving a bunch of old stuff that we can look at. So you want to crank up those logging levels to level three or four, or whatever, whatever works for your environment, to be able to go back and look at all the counters from a month ago or a week ago or whatever it is that you might need. Obviously, that's going to take more space in your SQL database or whatever database you're using. Now, ESX Top, um, really good tool. And at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to Dave and let Dave handle the next couple slides and talk about ESX Top and maybe even show some demos of it. Okay, go ahead and make me presenter then. All right. Uh, and I can share my desktop. Let's see here. I want to share that one. And uh, let me pop up an ESX top here first uh, up here on this server. So let's. Uh, this is the device screen. So I'm seeing each of my devices by their EUI type address. I'm seeing queue length. I've got uh, active items in the queue and what's just queued. Uh, commands per second, which is IOPS, my reads and writes per second, megabyte reads and megabyte writes. You see I don't have a lot of activity going on here. I'm updating it fairly rapidly. Uh, then I've got my latency, device latency, uh, kernel latency, how much latency it's waiting in the kernel queues. And G is guest latency. It's the, the combination of the other two. Basically, device plus kernel is, is what the guest is going to see. Uh, and then Q, average time in the queue as well per command. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to crank some load up. Uh, well, let's look at some other counters first. Here's V for VM's disk. And again, this is per VM now rather than per device commands, reads and writes, and, and latency read and write uh, as well here. So I can see each VM and what's happening with it. And then D for disk is my uh, device driver, my device uh, adapters here. So uh, my HBAs. So I'm on software iSCSI. So 38 is my software iSCSI, and yeah, I haven't got much going on in this host to here at all, apparently. So uh, oh, I hit uh, expand, excuse me, I hit an E in there. Enter, all right, there we go. Now, I've got, now I can see some I.O. So, uh, all right, so you can really drill down here and see where the traffic is and what's going on with it. Now, Here's IO meter, so I'm going to put a load on this guy, and what I've done is I've set up a disk here, and it's sitting on the nimble. So the nimble, of course, is uh, has a high amount of of uh, SSD cache in it. So uh, it's got a little over two terabytes of SSDs, 2.4 before it was formatted, so it's about 2.1, I think, uh, formatted capacity of SSDs, which are strictly for read cache. It's got SATA drives uh, for mass storage, and then it uses for writes, it's actually using non-volatile RAM. 
So writes happen very quickly as it goes to the non-volatile RAM cache first. It's immediately responding back that that write is complete. And then uh, it compresses and stores the data out onto disk and stripe. So all writes are sequential as it writes a new stripe each time it fills up a stripe uh, from the non-volatile RAM. So very rapid writes uh, occurring at least from the viewpoint of our VMware. So right here I've got a, a disk sitting on our Nimble and I've set up an access spec. So we'll edit this, show you what I'm doing here. I've got a 64K, 50% uh, read, 50% write, and it's a, a random, 100% random access. So this thing is going to going to hit it hard, similar to what a SQL Server would do doing 64K writes. All right. In addition, I've set up over here on the disk targets the number of outstanding IOs to send it. Since SQL Server is multi-threaded, it's going to be sending multiple IOs at a time. So I'm telling it, OK, I'm going to hammer this thing. I'm going to try and dump 100 IOs into the queue and keep that queue full with IOs. So I'm going to run this guy and save the results out in the file. And immediately I'm getting 6,000 IOPS <laughs> according to this, five, 6,000 IOPS out of it. Uh, IO response time with 100 IOs in there, 15 millisecond response time. So I'm getting some uh, very rapid IOs. Even with 100 in the queue, it's it's responding very quickly. If I go look at the nimble here, I see that set my uh, uh, bandwidth here coming into the nimble is running uh, up over 300 megabytes per second, both read and writes. Now, 300 megabytes is what? Uh, da, 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 three gigabits? approximately, so we're hammering three gigabits a second IOs on both in and out. So we're hitting that 10 gig pretty hard here uh, with uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of three gigabit of, of throughput. Okay, uh, in addition, we can go look at our ESX top again, and let's go to that uh, the devices, and you can see here that we're piling up active Q61. We're getting 10,000 total uh, commands that are actually going out to the SAN, you know, jumping around uh, that 10,000 IOP number. And let me get this over here and see what's happening. Yeah, it's the actual IOPS coming from the SAN you see is even even through here is, is creeping up. As it, and I've seen it actually hit as much as 12,000 IOPS here. Uh, 500 megabytes per second going both ways. Uh, this is a total. So we can see that same kind of data here with the uh, guest average uh, uh, of being about seven, floating around that seven uh, millisecond time frame uh, as VMware is reporting it from the guest. Uh, so very uh, uh, detailed information. Now, let's have a little bit more fun with it. I've got another VM over here with the similar kind of setup. I got virtual disks, the same 100 IOPS, the same uh, 64. So let's crank up another one. This is sitting on the same LUN. So immediately, it's driving up into the same 6,000 IOP range. And this is still driving 8, 9,000, still climbing, as we're now hitting 15,000 IOPS, 16,000 IOPS, as these are both uh, uh, driving into that same line. Okay, Total around 900 megabytes per second. In fact, we're rapidly getting up to up to 10 megabytes per second, or uh, 10 gigabits per second, almost eight eight to 10 gigabits. Let's go look at the SAN again, and we can see the jump here, where we're seeing you know 400 plus uh, megabytes per second, both read and write. Okay, so. Uh, we're cooking 
uh, in the neighborhood of uh, you know three and a half to four gigabit per second were driving over the network. Okay. So Dave, what does the actual network controllers on the VMware host look like? On these VMs, we I am running the uh, uh, pair of virtual controllers within the VMs, and you can see that my uh, usage CPU usage is about 13 percent here. Uh, I've done experiments with both para virtual and I and, and the uh, uh, LSI parallel, and I found that the para virtual controller within the VM actually reduces CPU utilization by something like this I/O meter, where it's hammering it by as much as 30 percent CPU less. So you really want to use those para virtual controllers to optimize the CPU. As far as what's happening with the uh, performance of the disk itself, that really doesn't translate to a lot of extra disk performance with the paravirtual. It gets to that next I.O. a little bit faster because it's using less CPU, so there's a slight increase in performance, but it's not that dramatic 30% that you're seeing on the CPU side. So those drivers are far more efficient uh, with CPU than what uh, the LSI driver would be. So at what it's point in time would I want to switch from the LSI logic adapter to the para virtual adapter? I mean, would I want to use that all the time? I would run them on every VM. Really? The para virtual is supported by all the various operating systems. I would put the para virtual on all virtual machines unless there's some specific reason it can't be. If now, are you so talking for all disks or just for data disks? for all disks. There's no reason not to use it for all of them. Is there anything yeah. special I have to do if I want to run my C drive on a para virtual adapter? Not at all. It takes a little it takes a little trick on the Windows side in order to get to get that converted over. You do need to get the para virtual controller installed, maybe set up the data drive first, get it going on a, on a para virtual controller and then 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 uh, power off the machine and uh, swap over the C drive to para virtual at that time. So can I, can I change an existing VM or do I have to build all new VMs? No, you can change it in the VM. As I say, you just add another drive, make sure that the, with the para virtual in it, that gets the driver installed within the VM, then shut down the VM, and, and then you can delete this extra drive and change the main controller over to the para virtual. If you just go in and change it without going through these extra steps, you're going to get a blue screen because the driver's not loaded into the registry and so forth uh, so that it knows where it's at. Okay, great. Thanks. So, uh, and you can see now that uh, here over time, the IOPS are balancing out. I've got storage I.O. control turned on on these data stores. Now, storage I.O. control is available all, you know, down, to, down to standard edition now. And it is actually balancing the load, even though these are running on different hosts. Notice this VM is running on 5.0, and this one, oh, get out of there. There it is. It's running on 8.0. They're running on different ESXi hosts. VMware is balancing those IOPS, and eventually they should equal out. Okay, so we're getting a total of about 12,000 IOPS now, uh, maybe 12.5, uh, and they are slowly balancing out. In a little bit, they, they will be balancing those. If we go back and look at our ESX top again, and uh, let's go to the other one. I've got it uh, spread out a little bit more. Uh, okay, 60. We're getting our uh, commands per second is coming down. You know, as I say, it's reporting a little different in here than what it is within uh, the I/O meter, but uh, around 5,000 some uh, commands per second. 26, about 50-50 reads and writes here uh, to that. So, all right, now, let's have a little bit more fun. I'm going to shut this guy down, and I set up some other disk targets. On here, this disk is on the same line as the other one. 
So I'm going to pick both of them and run them both now on the same one, starting off around 6,000, bumping up to 8, but it's coming down fast. Uh, and here it comes down. Those are actually on different SCSI controllers within the VM. Inside the VM here, uh, let's go to edit settings on the VM, and you see that hard disk 4, which is the, the uh, third one that I saw listed, is on the same data store, and it's on SCSI controller 3, a pair of virtual. The first disk I was testing is this one. It's on the same data store, and it's on controller 0, which is also a virtual. Okay. And I'm getting 7,000 IOPS, and it's coming down. Again, we'll see some balance uh, with what's happening over here. Eventually, it will come down to that same level. They should balance out eventually. Let's, uh, let's get this one out of the way and let this thing settle out. This one stopped. This one will be able to crank up and it's getting up to 8,000 IOPS, 8,100, and it sh it'll actually get up, uh, as I say, up to the 10 or 12,000 IOP range. Rapidly heading up. Let's let it run here for just a little bit, see how far it goes. Uh, another item that we want, I want to talk about while we're waiting for this is this whole new SAN situation we're dealing with. Uh, there's a number of SANs out there, of course, that are all solid state, extreme I.O. and so forth, that are, that are pushing us to all solid state. We've got brand new technology coming out shortly, Intel and uh, Micron are both working on a new type of 3D uh, technology for SSDs that they're saying is seven, you know, in samples they've, give, they've shown seven times faster than the current SSDs out there. And more endurance and so forth as well. They actually don't have a trans, don't use transistors, it uses a resistance technology, blah, blah, blah. But uh, 3D, they're putting more layers on them. We're going to see, they're talking about 15, 16 terabyte units. Samsung is already putting out 3D using older technology NANs, uh, SSDs, and they're talking about 15, 16 terabyte uh, uh, drives here within the next few months. Uh, they're not out yet. Uh, they're even talking about a uh, 10 terabyte consumer or uh, yeah, 10, no, I think it's 4 terabyte consumer uh, level SSD that's going to be out about the same time, and then these bigger bigger ones for, uh, for you know, enterprise level. So these are going to give us the ability to build some massive SANs in the tune of, you know, uh, oh, somewhere between a quarter and a, and a half a petabyte in a 2U chassis. But the issue here is going to be bandwidth all through the network. I mean, if we can push, as you see here, 500 megabytes per second from one host to one SAN here with just a, a couple of SSDs, what's that going to mean when we go to, uh, you know, 24 SSDs sitting in a chassis? We're, I mean, the buses aren't going to be able to handle it. The interfaces aren't going to be able to handle it, particularly if it's seven times faster than this. Uh, I think it's going to push us into the virtual SAN environment. Okay. Uh, I.O. Control is standard edition, you know. Uh, the... Uh, it's going to push us into the hybrid con or the, the hyper converged systems that we're starting to see already hitting the market in the vSAN uh, tech type technology that VMware is offering. In six, VMware does allow you to create an all vSAN, all SSD vSAN array. Okay, 
So this allows you to have uh, local SSDs mirroring data between different hosts. And of course, other, other vendors have been doing this for some time. Simplicity and others have been doing this kind of thing, Nutanix, uh, for several years. So this would be able to make sure that data is on the local machine rather than coming across interfaces that may actually end up being bottlenecks before long. 40 gig Ethernet, 100 gig Ethernet are out there, but think about the, the speed issues. Uh, we could actually saturate well over 10 gig easily, and the cost of, of these 40 and 100 gig technologies are pretty pricey at the moment at any rate. So it seems like we've settled in somewhere around 9 here with 2 on the same data store. Now, I'm going to stop this and then do one more. Here I've got another one. Disk 2 is on a different data store. And let's crank this guy up. Different controller, different data store. Immediately I'm over 10 and going up. We're now dealing with multiple queues per LUN, you see. We've got a queue per LUN within the ESX host. And We'll, we're going to be able to get more throughput because we've got more queues on the ESX host out there if we have the data spread across multiple runs. So I'm getting up to 10,000 instead of 9,000, and, and we may even creep up a little bit more here. I think we're actually probably hitting some of the boundaries on the IOs of the, uh, on the SAN itself. I mean, 10,000 IOPS on, a, on an SSD is, is doing pretty good. If we go back and we look at the uh, SAN, take one more look out here, we can see what the cache hit ratio is. This is our cache hit ratio. So we're getting most of our IOs are coming from uh, the cache, 90-some percent of it is hit coming from the SSD. Uh, response times are good. Not getting as much data because as what I was when I had two hosts hammering the SAN, I'm hitting bottlenecks within the one ESX host. I got more total throughput, megabytes per second, and IOPS, well, these were both on the same line, excuse me. These are now on different lines. This is actually the line. Let me go up to all volumes here. There we go. We're getting similar throughput, you see, of total off of the SAN. So we're hitting some SAN limitations here. This is across two lines. This is across one. My single VM, however, is hammering about 10 instead of 9, getting a little bit more throughput out of that single VM by moving it across two different lines. OK, uh, why don't you go on back, and uh, I'll give it back to you, Sean, for a, for a little bit. And we'll... Thank you, Dave. All right, so Dave was demonstrating the use of ESX Top. And uh, with that, obviously that's the command line thing that showed a bunch of data up there on the screen. We can hit different fields, like the C key would give us CPU. If we hit the D key, uh, that would switch us to the device from the adapter screen and V for VM. And as he was showing and demonstrating, you can hit the E to expand the fields. So we can get some really good information. Um, and then down here, we got some of the things that you want to look for, uh, like the commands per second the uh, responses per second and, and stuff like that. So very good tool when you're analyzing it. But you saw that wasn't the only tool that he was using. He was using the SAN. He was using the performance of vCenter. And he was using ESX Top. So there's not one place you can go to answer all questions about everything. And here's Visual ESX Top, where you can go in and through a nice little graph, see all of the stock all the stuff that we were getting through the ESX top command. So it's just an enhanced version of the, the R ESX top and ESX top, and it can connect to vCenter or to an ESXi host if you uh, don't have vCenter in your environment. 
Now, that Visual ESX Top will work in both Linux and Windows, by the way. Ah, very cool. Thank you. Now, here's something that was uh, actually taken from VMware at VMworld. And what they're doing here is they're showing that when you set up a disk, you have the ability to choose the type of controller available. And we can do that on a per controller basis. You can have up to four SCSI controllers within your VM. And you now also can have um, SATA controllers available to you as well. But we're looking at the SCSI controllers for the disks. And you can go here and choose bus logic, which is an old technology. You really don't want to use that anymore. The LSI logic parallel and SAS, which are two options available. And then the para virtual, which Dave demonstrated and shows that for high, high uh, operations, it gives us a little bit less CPU utilization and a little bit more throughput. So you'll, you'll want to use that, as he mentioned, if available. You've got to have at least vSphere 4 and hardware version 7. I hope no one's running anything older than vSphere 4. But here, here's what's interesting. So we've got a machine over here, an ESX host, and we've got a box running Exchange 2013. And when you, regardless of what operating system you're running inside the Windows VM, when you build a VM and you add a hard disk and go next, 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 it adds each additional hard disk to the very first SCSI controller, which is SCSI controller zero inside that virtual machine. So if we, if we do the typical admin, next, 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 it goes in there and adds that single adapter. Well, if we go through here, and let me show you how to add additional adapters to a VM. And here's some of my VMs here. So here's an old Exchange VM that we have. So let me take this guy here. And you'll see it's got a bunch of hard drives in this guy because it's an Exchange server. So we've got a bunch here. But let's say I wanted to add a new one. You'll see I've got one SCSI controller set up exactly the way it shouldn't. So we go through here. I want to add a new hard drive. And just next, 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 finish. And it just goes through there. Well, right here, what I'd want to do is I want to choose a different SCSI controller. You see it defaults to 010. But I want to say, no, I don't want to use 010. I want to use 10. And just next, finish. And look what it gets down here. Not only do I get the new hard disk, but I get the new SCSI controller. Now you'll see it's LSI Logic SAS. I can then go in here and change the type and make it a pair of virtual. Um, so I can, I can set that up. Well, of course, like Dave mentioned, want to have all the VMware tools and stuff installed in there to be able to access that driver. But I can set that up. So pretty easy to do. But let's go back and see why we would want to particularly do that. So let's see here. All right, so in this particular case, on this slide we have one controller and 10 disks, or whatever's in there, yeah, 10. So what if we took the same virtual machine and those same 10 disks, and what if we created in this case, more SCSI controllers. So now we've got a total of four SCSI controllers and we just distributed those disks between the SCSI controllers. Well, did I change my physical storage? No. Did I change my physical ESXi host? No. Um, did I even move my VMDKs to different storage? No. All I did was add these virtual SCSI controllers. Well, what difference is that gonna make? Well, Here's what I thought was kind of interesting. And, and what they did was, using jet stress, they built a virtual machine on an Exchange 2013. And with one virtual SCSI adapter, they had five VMDKs, which are hard disks for a VM, and five databases. What they did, one database per, per VMDK. They ran jet stress on this and then monitored latency and things like that they're getting. Now, when, when you look at this over here, there's two things we're looking at here, read and write latency on the left, and then over here. So over here on the left, we have read and write in these columns here. And then over here, they have IOPS, read and write. So IO per second. So if we look at this, we have five disks, and you'll see that we are having latency as high as 100 milliseconds over here, and as low as 10 milliseconds over here. So different disks were operating differently running through this one virtual SCSI adapter. Now you'll see over here, we had 300 read IOPS on this disk and 255 write IOPS. And they're all about average for the disk, about the same, for a total aggregate of 2,900 IOPS across those five disks. 
Now you'll notice down here in the bottom, we also had some database page fault stalls of almost 62 database page fault stalls, which is not good. Now by just taking this VM and distributing these VMDKs across multiple virtual SCSI adapters here, look what we did now. I don't have a single latency reading over 20. So they're all pretty average over here, but here's what's pretty neat. We now, our aggregated IOPS have almost doubled from 2,900 to 5,200 IOPS. And our database page fault stalls have gone to zero. So kind of interesting there how that works by just adding those in. So that was something I, had, I thought was pretty neat. So when we look at what do we typically see wrong out there? And uh, wrong controller type, people are using, you know, maybe the LSI logic and they should be using the pair of virtual, not enough spindles. Uh, Dave and I were working with a customer that uh, had about 30 physical machines and they went and virtualized and uh, their physical machines, when they were back when they were physical, were running, you know, five, six disks in a RAID 5 and they took and virtualized all these guys and the company before us had them purchase a SAN that had eight SATA spindles on it. So they're going from six spindles on each physical host to eight spindles for all 30. And they were, they were getting tons of complaints that, you know, applications were running really, really slow. Well, we looked at some of the counters and we had a lot of latency and, you know, we're, we're just getting really bogged down because of these disks. So what we did is, as a little test was we, one of the hosts had uh, six local disks in it. We took this one VM that was pretty important to them and we just stored vMotion it over to the local disks and boom, all the problems went away with that one guy. So one of the things that we try to do is we then put them into a better sand that suited what they needed based upon what they're using now and what their future use was going to be. So that was a big problem, not having enough spindles. We've seen that time and time again. Um, not enough bandwidth. You know, if you're running a, you know, obviously with them and their eight SATA drives, one gigabit per second was perfectly fine. But if you're running some pretty good caching, we saw where Dave was pushing 500 megabytes per second to our SAN. If you look at 500 megabytes per second, that's about four gigabits per second. So realistically, you're going to need 10 gig E. If not, your limiting factor is your one gigabit going back to that SAN. You'd also want to look at things like multipathing and configuring that. Uh, too many virtual machines per data store. You're going to run into this if you're running iSCSI or fiber channel. So you're going to want to limit it, you know, based upon your SAN, based upon your disk, based upon, you know, SCSI disk queue length, you're probably going to want to limit it somewhere between 10, maybe as many as 20. There's no exact science to that. You kind of got to see, you know, how many disks does each VM have, how many I.O. are they pushing, you know, how fast your disks on the back end. So you want to look at some of that. As I mentioned, the multi -packing. That's particularly if you're, yeah, let, let me jump in a little bit. That's sure. particularly if you're running 5.1 and earlier. In 5.5, they changed the locking mechanism, so those numbers are much higher in 5.5 and 6 now, so that we can put, you know, quite a few more VMs out there. Uh, quote, unquote, I think VMware says you can put 256 or some ridiculous number in 5.5. I wouldn't want to go that high, but certainly the locking problems prior to 5.5 were terrible. <laughs> Uh, I've actually seen people go from fiber channel to NFS, which doesn't have that locking problem, uh, you know, actually yank out, you know, expensive fiber channel and go to NFS uh, because they couldn't put more than 10 to 12 VMs on, on a run, and it just wasn't satisfying their requirements. So uh, it's uh, much better now in 6, and we can certainly put a lot more VMs out there, you know, 60 or more. Uh, running VMs on, on a run without a problem. Uh, I think we've, we've got, uh, you know, in that number or higher on our uh, Nimble right now. So big changes. 
Uh, NFS doesn't have that problem at all. This is one of the reasons why NetApp in particular has pushed very, very hard for NFS on their uh, on their systems and you know primarily uh, offer it 10 gig of course uh, a lot of arguments uh, you know whether five you know 8 gig fiber or 10 gig uh, NFS or iSCSI uh, is is equivalent you probably go either way on that uh, now of course we're pushing up to uh, up to even faster speeds so all right yeah. go ahead I have one customer running uh, NFS volumes, and we have about 80 virtual machines running on one NFS volume, uh, and it's being replicated with SnapMirror to a DR location for a SRM, and not a problem with any of that. So, uh, thin provisioning. Uh, I like thin provisioning, but you know, you have to get with your SAN vendor depending on the application that you're running. Uh, like, for example, with Exchange, there's a requirement that you use thick provision disk. Uh, doesn't mean that it won't work thin provisioned. But if I'm going into your company and setting up Exchange, I would not set it up thin provisioned and put you into an unsupported status from Microsoft. And this is what gets difficult when you're working with a, a VMware situation is you have a NetApp that says you should do it this way. You've got a VMware that says you should do it this way. And you've got... Microsoft for the ultimate application that you're running that says that you should do it this way, and you start going, well, gosh, what do I do? And and that you know can be difficult when you're trying to figure all that out. So when we look at a disk fragmentation perspective, we really don't have a problem with fragmentation on a virtual machine guest OS level. Where you really run into the problem with fragmentation is if you have thin provisioned virtual machines. And if we look at a, a LUN here, I'm just going to do a real simple drawing. Oops. If we look at a LUN right here, and let's say I've got a VM, and we'll just call it Red, Red VM, and it's thin provisioned. It starts out zero bytes in size, and it grows to 10 gigs. All right, great, awesome. Well, now I build the blue VM, and it goes here, and it grows to 10 gigs, and then I build the green VM, and it goes here and grows to 10 gigs. Great. Well, each of these VMs is configured with a 100 gig hard disk. Well, now the red VM wants to write some data there, wants to expand its uh, VMDK, but it can't contiguously expand the VMDK, so it's got to grow over here to whatever it needs. And, and this is where you get your fragmentation. And really, the only way you can bring those back together is to store vMotion, that guy, to a different... Uh, LUN or data store. Now that uh, that's prevented by building thick provision virtual disks. So that's one of the problems you run in with fragmentation and thin provision. Yeah, I've got a 10 minute lecture that I go through on fragmentation in our classes and fragmentation and disk alignment. Really in modern SANS here, fragmentation is, is not as big of a deal because in our modern SANS with compression and dedupe going on, the blocks aren't contiguous anyway. They're all over the disk. Uh, when you write a new block, it gets compressed. It gets put to a new location on the physical disk. So at that point where it really matters is what the blocking factors are and the alignment to make sure that when you do one disk I.O. from the VM that you're actually generating one disk I.O. on the SAN so that it can go out and grab that sector wherever it is on the SAN. Going back a little bit to uh, to you know, thin provisioning in general, if we're doing dedupe and compression, either one on the SAN, there is no point in thin provisioning from the SANS point of view. It's going to compress those zeroed out blocks if you if you eager zero it. It's going to compress that down to nothing. It's going to dedupe it down to nothing. So you might as well eager zero everything if your SAN is doing dedupe and compression or one or the other. Okay, some are doing both. So. 
a huge difference here in the whole way we think about storage as we're moving into these new technologies and, and getting away from some of the more traditional we're using. In one of our SANs is an old Equalogic. It's a straight thin, straight deal where exactly the kind of picture he's showing here is the way it works. <laughs> We don't, it doesn't have compression, it doesn't have dedupe, it doesn't have SSD cache, <laughs> you know, doesn't have any of that kind of stuff because it's an old beast. So it sounds like you really need to get with your sand vendor and figure out what works with your environment, which is, which is again, I'm a VMware guy, I'm not a sand guy, so, but to be a VMware guy, I've got to understand the sand technologies to really utilize it correctly. And if your sand does support that dedupe, you're right. Build your VMs as thick eager and let it do all the deduplication. And with VAAI, we can offload the zeroing out of the of the uh, eager zero thick disk back to the SAN. We'll talk about that here in a second. Some other technologies we have available is storage vMotion, where we can on the fly with the virtual machine running, we can move it from one data store to another. And storage DRS, where it automates that process by default every eight hours and moves it around as needed based upon capacity and IOPS. Now, one other thing you look at, and you know, you can argue that this is networking or you can argue that this is storage, is jumbo frames. And specifically, when we're talking IP based storage, which is NFS or iSCSI, you're going to want to configure jumbo frames. And when you look at a typical frame, uh, you're talking about a 1542 byte frame and the frame is set up as 1500 bytes of, of data but then it's got headers and footers in that packet things like source IP address source MAC address uh, destination IP address destination MAC address and to get jumbo frames working and trust me we could do a huge lecture on this you've got to configure it on your SAN on your physical switches, on your host, on your VM kernel ports, on your virtual switches, potentially port groups. You know, it depends if you're running uh, standard virtual switches or distributed switches within VMware. And then what you're going to want to do is go into the, uh, the console, put it into your ESXi host, and verify that you can get an end-to-end -end ping from your ESXi host to your SAN. And we don't just run ping this IP address. Well, we to verify Jumbo Frames is working, we want to actually increase the size of our packet. So we'll do a, a VMK ping dash S, and then we'll put the packet size in there. Now, you'll want to get with your SAN vendors, or, or excuse me, your switch vendors, because they will actually recommend that you increase the size of your switch beyond 9,000. In VMware, we're going to set it to 9,000, but on your switches, Cisco recommends, I can't remember the exact number, but somewhere between 10 and 11,000 bytes on your Cisco switches. So you want to get with your switch vendors and find out what they recommend to set it to. You want to get with your SAN vendors and recommend see what they recommend to set it to. But I know VMware is 9,000. And then you'll ping the, the target host. From Windows, you do a ping dash I. So you're choosing which interface and then your ultimate target that you're pinging to verify that it goes through utilizing jumbo frames. And we've set that up at numerous customers, and we've seen some huge improvements. You can get anywhere up to 25% improvement just by using jumbo frames. And one of the things I was mentioning earlier is VAAI. And there's a couple of things with SANS that we're looking at. One's called VASA. One's called VAAI. And VAAI, what that allows us to do is offload stuff to our SAN. As an example, if you let's say you have an old SAN that doesn't support VAAI. If I go build a virtual machine and give it thick, eager zero disks, my virtual center, ESXi host, is going to have to build that disk on the SAN, and it's going to have to write all of these zeros to all of those blocks inside that VMDK. And that's going to take a while for virtual center to do it. With VAAI, what it does is the virtual center talks to the SAN and says, hey, man, I need to build a disk for this VM, and I need you to throw a bunch of zeros in it. And boom, in seconds, the SAN does it because it's real quick. And same thing with deleting free space, cloning or copying data. Uh, we can clone VMs really quickly. We're offloading it to the SAN. Um, the ATS, creation, locking of files, all of that we can offload to the SAN, which makes it much faster. So you want to make sure that your SAN support VAI, and all the new ones do, 
Um, most of the older ones do. You potentially might have a, a SAM plugin that you'll want to install if you're using the vSphere client or maybe even the uh, web client, depending on what you're using. Then here, we're running a command here just to verify the SAM supports VAI. So here we ran ESXCLI storage core device VAI status get, and we pipe that to the more command, and you'll see the plugin it's using. In this particular case, it's using the VMware plugin. Uh, for Equalogic and what's supported. And you'll see all four of the things that we mentioned up at the top are supported. Great. Awesome. So you'll definitely want to check that. The VASA that I mentioned is a reporting feature where the SAN can actually go back and tell vCenter or the ESXi host that, hey, these are the kind of disks I'm running, like I'm running SSDs and, and get some information back. Otherwise, you'd have to go in there and specify what those are. So yeah, it's pretty easy to you pretty key that you make sure that your firmware is updated. If you haven't updated the firmware on the SAN in a year or two, there's a chance that some of these APIs aren't being supported, uh, particularly some of, the, some of the later ones. And of course, there's new stuff coming out now supporting VVOLs. So all the SAN vendors are starting to release their support for the VVOL code that's in 6. And now 6.1's out. So uh, it's certainly something that uh, is going to be, I, th I think VVOLs are going to be big. So keep keep those SANs updated. Hey, Dave, did you, uh, I'm done with my technical portion of the lecture. Did you have any other demos or anything that you wanted to talk oh, about? How are we doing on time? Uh, it looks like we're about out of time. I might show uh, the visual. Well, you had a decent shot of the visual ESX top, I guess. So. Okay, good. Someone, let me go over a few questions here. Uh, one of the questions someone had was at the end of the webinar, I mentioned these would be up on YouTube. How can I get to those? Well, we have a we have a YouTube channel. Uh, I believe it's YouTube.com, and then you can go to VM Training here, and this will bring up our VM Training website here. And you'll see some of the technical demonstration videos that we already have up here. And we'll get this uploaded here, uh, hopefully today, potentially tomorrow at the latest on that YouTube. Uh, we got another question. Could you go into RDM versus VMDK performance difference in vSphere 6 and if there's been any improvements uh, from 5.5? And Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Uh, the need for RDMs has really kind of gone away. Now that vSphere 5.5 supports you to have up to a 62 terabyte VMDK, the only reason you would need to use an RDM is if you're running some sort of clustering configuration where you need to have both machines access that NTFS type storage or um, what else would we need an RDM? But from an IOPS perspective, you're really not getting any performance advantage by going RDM over VMDK. And a lot of people have argued, you know, RDM is faster because you're getting direct disk, disk access uh, with the RDM versus the VMDK, which is a, you know, a, a file sitting on top of a VMFS volume. Uh, so you're really not seeing a performance increase because of that. The big reason we would use RDMs back in the day back in, you know, let's say 4.1 days, was because we had a limitation of creating a D drive, which was only two terabytes in size, and I needed a 10 terabyte D drive to put file and print stuff on. So in that case, my only option was to go physical mode RDM. Did yeah, I agree well, on that, Dave? Yeah, there, yeah there, was a, there was a window there in 5 where that was the case. Um, the, the big issue, really right now, uh, is that uh, RDMs and, and VMDKs, the advantages of, of the VMDK to be able to move it around and easily manage it far outweigh any advantage for the raw device map. In fact, on sequential IOs, the VMDK actually performs better because of the way that ESXi uh, caches and, and deals with the VMDK. So it's actually better performance with VMDKs than raw device maps for sequential IOs. Uh, for other I, for random IOs, the, the difference is, is inconsequential. It's just, it's just not worth even talking about one way or the other. So, um, yeah, the, the 
the issues, we use raw device maps for some types of clusters. You'll use it there. Uh, the newer 2012 R2 Microsoft clusters, they now support VMDKs with those. So even that, that use of, VMD, of raw device maps is, is going away as well. So uh, major changes uh, with that support with 2012 here in 6 uh, further, further gets away or does away with the need for, for raw device maps. So. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, so we have today is part two, which is December 18th, uh, covering storage. Uh, part three, which will be December 21st, which I believe is Monday, uh, we'll get into some CPU analysis and dig pretty deep into that. Um, we'll then get into the 23rd, which I believe is Wednesday. We'll get into memory analysis. And then on the 29th, we'll hit networking. So we're going to get pretty deep, just like we did into storage today. Uh, I encourage all of you guys to register for each one of these. Um, at the end of the series, or in this one here, we've built a class called VCAP Prep and Advanced Admin, where it's a uh, we really get into it for those people that want to get the VCAP certifications, which is a certification above and beyond uh, VCP for anybody who wants to get that. Um, Dave and I both have those. Um, and, and we focus, like you've seen here, Dave and I do a lot of consulting. So we're not just read PowerPoint slide trainers. We get in and actually do this stuff. So we, we make for a really fun class. Um, for every one of these webinars that you attend, uh, you will get a ticket, per se, for a drawing, and at the end of the fifth webinar, uh, if you've attended all five, you'll get five tickets, so your chances of winning this gift card are a little better with five tickets versus one, uh, but we're going to have a Visa card gift giveaway, and then what we're going to do is we'll give someone a, a Visa card, and we'll post your face up on our Facebook site, and, you know, you'll go buy me $50 worth of gifts and send it to me with that gift card. No, you can do whatever you want with it. But if you're interested in the, any classes that we have on VMware or any other technologies, please reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to help you. If you need some help with a performance analysis, um, reach out to us with that. And, again, sign up for any upcoming webinars that we might have. So I'm going to go ahead and end the...